Well, as I said before, the largest migration of animals on our planet happens every night. While you're sleeping, billions of tons of animals are rising from the depths in the ocean towards the surface, where, after a long day out in the sun, lots of phytoplankton exist. Now, why do those organisms stay down during the day? Why don't they rise up into the surface and feed all the time? The answer is predation. These organisms hide out in the dark, just like anybody else might hide in the dark so to avoid being seen. This vertical migration of organisms includes a whole bunch of different organisms, including little microbes, dinoflagellates uh, in particular, jellyfish, different kinds of worms, shrimps, different kinds of crustaceans other than the shrimps, squids and fishes. They ascend from the deep to feed on the plankton-rich surface waters every night. They ascend to the tune of billion tons or more of living carbon. Think about that. A billion tons of carbon is rising up from the depths every night. That's a significant global event that happens every night. So they're redistributing carbon in the water column. They're changing the dynamics of uh, food webs in the water column every night. And so these are, this process, this vertical migration, is going to have very important implications, again, for the carbon cycle. Prey may be consumed at the surface, so these organisms rise up, they eat something, and then they descend in the depths where they poop it out, and that's brought carbon from the surface to depths. That's one major effect of this process, this vertical migration on uh, the carbon cycle. So as we'll learn and as, we'll, uh, as we talk about food webs and talk about ocean productivity, we want to keep this kind of process in mind because it certainly has implications, again, for climate change and understanding climate change. Here's a detailed picture of vertical migration. Now, this is a figure from your book, and I suggest that you take some time to study this figure because it's amazing how much it can tell you. But this is something called backscattering. So we're using sound to determine where organisms are and how many of them are there. And the organisms in their highest concentrations are in the yellows and reds. These are different times of year. And these are hours of the day. So here's January, February, March, April, May, and so on. And here we see in the night hours, we see yellow, which means that the organisms are up near the surface. This is 0 to 200 on each uh, the depth here, depth scales. What do we see happening to the amount of organisms from January through May, June, and July? The colors are getting more intense, so we're seeing higher concentrations of organisms as we would expect, because springtime is when organisms when the, during the spring bloom, when the, when the water column stratifies, that's when zooplankton and these kinds of animals grow and reproduce as well. So this figure illustrates quite well the increase in the concentration of zooplankton, or the vertical migrators, as a result of the seasonal cycle. It also shows that the clear periods where there aren't very many organisms in the surface waters gets longer. Why is that? What do we know happens to vertical migration in the summer months versus the winter months? What's longer in the summer versus the winter? If you enter day length, you score points. With the days getting longer, the opportunity for, or the length of time that you're going to be able to spend at the surface is shortened because nighttime is shortened. And this graph, amazing uh, in its detail, shows exactly that kind of thing. So vertical migration only happening at night and the period of vertical migration getting shorter during the summer months because the nights are shorter. This is truly one of those graphs that are worth a thousand words. 
Now here's one that a lot of us are interested in or know something about, something called aggregation. And aggregation is simply a word for things being clumping together or coming together. A school of fish is an example of aggregation. But also we find that plankton aggregate. And when their distribution is non-uniform, that is when we find different clumps of phytoplankton or zooplankton, we call that patchiness. Plankton also aggregate in very thin layers. So where we had the chlorophyll maximum, which I showed you before, thin layers are very thin chlorophyll maximums. We also find down on the beach things like organisms coming together for mating, whether it's squid, uh, squid mating frenzies or sea hare orgies. And if you don't know what these are, I'll tell you about them sometime. Um, krill swarms or bait balls, all these kinds of things, schools of fish. All of these are examples of aggregation, organisms coming together for some purpose, whether it's mating or feeding or escaping predators. And all of these have an impact on not only just the distribution of organisms, but the, again, the flow of energy and matter in the world ocean in ways that we really don't yet appreciate or in ways that we're just beginning to understand and figure out. So here's one that's popular along the California coast, the California grunion. Each year between uh, February and August, immediately two to three or four days after the full or new moon at night, after the high tide, the grunion come up on our beaches and mate. And grunion runs are amazing things, and we'll talk about them when we talk about tides. But they are one example of an aggregation of fish. Here's another one bait balls and we'll see an example of that when we watch the open oceans video in our classes but if you get a chance to check it out in the blue planet series they have some spectacular images of these schools of fish these synchronized swimming fish uh, called bait balls just incredible dense and um, synchronous movements of fish